Let us worship God and sing to his praise from Psalm 85, and we'll sing verses 6 to 13. This is the second half of Psalm 85. And if you have a red psalter with the tunes at the top, the tune is Southwark, which is number 131. It opens with these, the section we're singing opens with these words, that in thee may thy people joy. Wilt thou not us revive? Show us thy mercy, Lord. To us do thy salvation give. And so the whole purpose of asking for the Lord to revive his people, to renew us, is in order that we might find our joy in him. So we'll sing Psalm 85, verses 6 to 13. Let's stand and seek God's face together in prayer. Our most glorious God in heaven, we come rejoicing indeed in all that belongs unto you. We have found you to be our joy, the object of our faith and love, our joy, the the one in whom we do find peace. And we come, O Lord, to give you the glory. And we come, O Lord, rejoicing and acknowledging that no works are like unto your works. Uh, You are a God who has, in the council of eternity, uh, planned uh, the purchase of your own people. And in the fullness of time, you have sent forth your Son, to accomplish this great work of securing our salvation. And you have likewise been pleased to send forth your Holy Spirit and to take the things of Christ and to apply all of the provisions that are found in him, to apply them to our our weary souls. O Lord, indeed, uh, no works are like unto your works. You're the God who called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees and who brought him uh, through a barren land, in order to bring him uh, to the place that you had secured for your people. And you entered into a covenant with him and showered him with promises and tokens of your love to him 
and to his seed after him. And you promised that all who blessed him would be blessed and all who cursed him would be cursed. And you have been pleased, O Lord, to maintain that promise down to this very uh, moment, to this present hour. You are our God and we are your people and your promise endures to us and to our, our children after us. We rejoice in this uh, covenant love, the covenant of grace that has been uh, given to us for all of the privileges that are showered upon us uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ. How thankful we are that he is the mediator of that covenant. We are, rejoice, O Lord, that he has redeemed us just as he brought Israel out with the strength of his own arm and divided the Red Sea and caused the horse and the rider of Pharaoh to be cast into the deluge of those waters and to destroy uh, the enemies of your people. So you have come and you have been pleased to uh, secure this uh, eternal salvation for your people, destroying uh, the devil and sin and death and hell and emptying it of all of its power in order that we might receive the forgiveness of sins and free grace uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ, to be reconciled unto you and to be given an inheritance which is eternal in the heavens. O oh Lord, we thank you that our salvation does not depend upon our own wit and wisdom, the strength of our own resolve, or the power of our own arm. For surely uh, we would have perished long ago if that were the case. But you are the keeper of Israel and you keep us uh, by your grace. And we are in the clutch and hand of one who is omnipotent. And this is our source of rest and consolation. We thank you that righteousness and peace have kissed, and we see it most clearly in the cross, where the righteousness of God and the peace that is to be found with God are both present in all of their fullness. And we would again come this day to rejoice in Christ crucified and to uh, think of all of the abundance that is to be found in him. We pray that our hearts would be drawn out to, to bow down, to worship you in the beauty of your holiness, to worship you in godly fear, uh, to worship in the joy of the Holy Ghost, and to worship with sincere faith that in all that we are about, we would seek uh, you and that we would find you, that you would open our eyes, that we may behold wondrous things out of your law, and that as your praise is taken up into our lips and your word read and preached, that you would disclose to us afresh something of your majesty and that our hearts uh, would be strangely warmed as we think of these uh, wonderful truths and as they are applied by your spirit to our souls. O oh Lord, we ask that you would forgive and cleanse us for all of our sins. We have been uh, hearers of the word and infrequently doers of the word. We confess, O oh Lord, that we have not walked in the light that has been given to us. And what we have known is pleasing to you, uh, we have not done. And what we have known is displeasing to you, uh, that we have, have often done. Lord, we see the corruption of indwelling sin that is yet within us, and we would bewail it and loathe ourselves, and we would confess, O Lord, that we stand every bit this day as we ever have in need of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, to cleanse us from sin and for our sins to be separated from us as far as the east is from the west, that you would remember them no more. We pray, O God, that your word would dwell in us richly, that we would be uh, a people that are filled with the Holy Scriptures, that our minds would be brimming with your divine truth, that we would make your law uh, not a, uh, an occasional stopover, but that we would be meditating upon your law uh, day and night, all the day and all the night, uh, that we would be enabled to think your thoughts after you, that we would esteem and love and count precious 
every letter and syllable and word that you have given to us by divine uh, revelation, that we would cherish it more than our necessary food, uh, more than gold and silver and precious stones, that the things of this world would be in contrast to the things of Christ and of eternity, uh, to be seen for what they are, to be subservient uh, to the main thing, the chief thing that you have called us to be about. We ask that you would bless this holy day to us, that you would be pleased to uh, use uh, the day uh, to shape and mold us, uh, to make us more like the Lord Jesus Christ, to draw out our affections and thoughts uh, heavenward, uh, that we would be stirred up to seek you in all that we are about. We pray that you would cause us to be bound together in, in self-denying uh, love, that we would weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice, that we would remember those who are bound as if we were bound with them, that we would esteem the interests of others above our own uh, interests and concerns that brotherly love would abound among us, that we would love one another fervently with a pure heart and that we would turn away from defrauding uh, our brother in any way and in any degree. Lord, we ask that you would strengthen us in this earthly pilgrimage, uh, how desperately we need uh, grace heaped upon grace, for uh, we need it more than even uh, our daily bread. We pray that you would give us uh, your portion that would sustain us, to guide us into your truth, to enable us to walk in your ways, to be uh, a people who are, who are abounding in the things of, of God. Uh, we ask that you would bless as well our temporal needs, that we would be unhindered and unencumbered in the service that we desire to render to you, uh, that the frailties of broken, uh, degrading bodies and all of the concerns of life and substance and work and uh, provisions, uh, that you would be Jehovah Jireh, that you would be providing for us uh, in order that we might be equipped with all that is necessary to serve you uh, with strength and with uh, endurance. O oh, Lord, help us to run the race that has been set before us, uh, to be looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Uh, grant that we would be uh, looking to that last day, which uh, yet is set before us, when we will leave this world, when uh, souls will be made perfect in holiness, where our bodies will be laid in the grave to rest in the hope of the, the coming resurrection. O oh Lord, sober us, uh, make us serious and earnest and exercised in all, of our, in all of our activities and ways. We pray for the unconverted, that amidst their delusions and distractions, uh, that amidst the intoxications of uh, the, the things of this world, that, that, that you would be pleased to blow the trumpet and arouse them from their slumber and to bring them and draw them unto yourself to a way of, of truth and of life, a way of peace uh, with you. We cry out to you, O God, to undertake uh, to do such wondrous things uh, amongst us. Uh, bless us, we ask, in the exercise of our souls and the worship that we are engaged in this day. And give us, we pray, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, the eternal uh, spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we, might, that we might know his presence and power and ministry in all that we're about. And we ask these things in that name which is above every name, even the name of our God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We come in our sequential singing to Psalm 17, verses 13 to 15. To Nistockton number 134, Psalm 17, verses 13 to 15, to tune 134. First part of this section is imprecatory. We're asking the Lord to arise and to scatter our enemies. 
But notice verse 15, as, as you well know, the, the Psalms cover uh, every aspect of biblical religion, all of who Christ is and all of his work and all of the functions and place of the three persons of the Godhead. It gives us history and law and gospel and all sorts of things. And here we see the doctrine of the resurrection uh, laid out in verse 15. But as for me, I thine own face in righteousness will see. And with thy likeness, when I wake, I satisfied shall be. We'll sing verses 13 to 15. Let us worship God in the reading of his word. Our Old Testament reading is found in the book of Psalms. And we'll, we'll read together from Psalm 27. So if you'll take your copy of God's word and turn with me this morning to Psalm 27. A Psalm of David. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion, and the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me, he shall set me up upon a rock. And now shall mine head be lifted up above mine enemies round about me. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy also upon me and answer me. When thou, didst, when thou saidest, Seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, Thy face, Lord, will I seek. Hide not thy face far from me. Put not thy servant away in anger. Thou hast been my help. Leave me not, neither forsake me, O God of my salvation. 
When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. Teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in a plain path because of mine enemies. Deliver me not over unto the will of mine enemies, for false witnesses are risen up against me and such as breathe out cruelty. I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Amen. And thus far, the reading of this portion of God's inspired word. We'll continue to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth, lifting up our hearts and voices to him by singing from Psalm 18, and we'll sing the first section, uh, verses 1 to 7. The tune is Moravia, which is tune number 89. Psalm 18, verses 1 to 7. We not only know the Lord, we not only serve the Lord, but we love the Lord. And that is expressed, our love to the Lord in these opening words. Thee will I love, O Lord my strength, my fortress is the Lord, my rock and he that doth to me deliverance afford, my God, my strength whom I will trust, a buckler unto me. The horn of my salvation and my high tower is he. Here we have a string of descriptions of all that is lovely about the Lord himself as our God. We'll sing verses 1 to 7.
Our New Testament reading is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, so Paul's first epistle to the church at Corinth. We'll read together the second chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Let us hear the word of God. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man, but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man." For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Amen. Please take your Bibles and turn with me this morning to the Gospel of John, chapter 16. And we will be giving our attention... To verses 12 to 15. So we will consider with the Lord's help, Gospel of John, chapter 16, verses 12 to 15. This is Jesus' farewell discourse, which we've been in for some time now, and it is Jesus speaking in these words. I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. Howbeit when he... The Spirit of truth is come. He will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. The Lord Jesus Christ is the center of history, the center of the world, the center of the Bible, uh, the center of the Christian life and of the church. We see this even in the name given to the Lord's people, first given at Antioch, where they were called Christians. The very word, the name Christ, is embedded in our religion, which is called Christianity. 
The Lord Jesus Christ is clearly central. The second person of the Trinity is the chief revelation of God to men. And so it ought to be that the Lord Jesus is seen as the central thing in all of life and in all of the world. And so it's no surprise to us as Jesus continues to instruct us in this farewell discourse, it's no surprise that the aim of the Holy Spirit is to magnify the Son. Knowing everything else that we know and having heard everything else that we've heard thus far since the beginning of chapter 14, it comes, uh, it comes to us almost as if it should be obvious that the Holy Spirit has the aim of magnifying the Son. So we've been considering the last couple of sermons, verses uh, 8 to 11, and there we see what Jesus describes as the ministry or the work of the Holy Spirit in the world. He will come to convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. And now he turns his attention from the work and ministry of the Spirit in the world to the work and ministry of the Spirit in the church. He's describing the work of the Spirit within the church. What was described earlier is, is seen and is done by believers, whereas what is before us is actually accomplished in believers, the work of the Spirit in the Lord's people. And there are two things that I especially want to, to highlight if we divide the passage in, in half, if you will. First of all, the Spirit shows the truth of Christ. So first of all, the Spirit shows the truth of Christ. Verses 12 and 13, I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. The Spirit shows the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 12, where Jesus makes a reference to his unfinished ministry, if you will. His unfinished ministry. I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. Literally, the word bear is, is carry. So I have many things to say, but you, you're not in a position at the present hour to carry what I would be unloading on you. He says there are many things. So it's not just the finishing touches of a little piece and a little, a little piece here and a little piece there. He's saying there's a great deal that still has to be conveyed to you, that still has to be unloaded uh, for your edification. He says you're not able to receive these things. You're not able to carry them right now. Why is that? It is because at this crossroads in the farewell discourse, the disciples are still standing on the far side of the cross. This is before the cross. This is before the resurrection. This is before what Jesus would convey after he's been resurrected. And it's before his, his ascension. And so there's a great deal for the disciples that is still unclear to them. Jesus has been loading them with divine truth. He's been telling them about himself and telling him about his work, all that is going to unfold, and it is not crystal clear to them right now. They don't foresee all that is going to unfold. They're, they're not anticipating it. But after all of the things that Christ has come to accomplish are completed, after the Lord Jesus Christ does that, then the Holy Spirit, he says, will come and open up the significance of all of these things. If you skip ahead a little into verse 13, how be it when, the, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. He's speaking about Pentecost. And he's saying after the cross, after the burial, after the resurrection, after the ascension, when the spirit is poured out, then there are going to be all sorts of things that are opened up uh, to, to you. The action has to take place before the explanation of the action. And that's exactly what Jesus is saying here. And so we have an eye to all that follows 
For example, in the New Testament, we have four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We're considering the fourth of those. But you think of how much is remaining in the New Testament scriptures, all the epistles of Paul and of Peter and of John and of Jude and the Apocalypse, the revelation of Christ, and so on and so forth, the Acts of the Apostles. There's a great deal that is still coming after all that is described to us in in the Gospels. And as the apostles look back on all that Jesus has done, and as they have called to their remembrance all that Jesus had told them before his death, burial, and resurrection, the Spirit would, as it were, open the treasure trove and begin to show them all of the wonders that God was accomplishing. And this fits the pattern, frankly, doesn't it? The Lord did not, immediately after the fall, in Genesis chapter 3, just say presto, and then deliver absolutely everything in one fell swoop to Adam and Eve right there outside uh, the gate of the garden. Not everything was accomplished at once, and not everything was revealed at once. And so through the the history of redemption, throughout the Old Testament, we have this unfolding of things. There's Noah, and there's the flood, and then there's Abraham, and then the patriarchs that follow him, and then there's the people going down into Egypt, and Moses bringing them out, and crossing the Red Sea in the wilderness, and then conquering the land, and then the rise of the period of the judges, followed by the monarchy, and all of the prophets that are brought after the divided kingdom. And at each of these stages, and all of the epics of redemptive history, God is doing something in history. He's accomplishing something. There's action, and there's explanation of the significance of those actions. And then, of course, the Old Testament gives way to the New Testament, and the fullness of time, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ as the incarnate word, all that unfolds in his ministry, and Pentecost, and then the, the work of the, the early church, and so on. The Lord did not give it all at once. And so what he's describing in verse 2 is perfectly in keeping with what we have come to expect in our reading of the Bible. He goes on in verse 13. Albeit when the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. Now, Jesus, just two chapters ago, described himself as truth, right? He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. So Jesus has described himself as the truth. Here, notice the spirit is given a title and a description of his work, and they go together. His title is the Spirit of Truth. His work is to guide the Lord's people into all truth. These two things go together. And it's, you know, the the picture that, that Jesus is using is the Spirit will come and show you the road, as it were, into all truth. So there's this, uh, to develop the picture, there's this country. We could say there's this continent or world of truth that God is pleased to reveal. And it is the Spirit's ministry to come as a guide, a leader, to guide us into the the road that leads us into that, conducting us, as it were, into unknown territory. And that, that includes not only discovery, you know, coming to see and understand and Uh, embrace and believe uh, the truth. It's It's not just discovery, but it's actually owning that truth, submitting to that truth. The Spirit is the one who guides us to see, but then to embrace by faith and to subject ourselves to the truth as it is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now he says he will guide you into all truth and the In the Greek, actually, the definite article is there, into all the truth, into all the truth, literally. Now, what does that mean, to guide you into all truth? Well, it's not saying that the Spirit will cause you to know everything about everything. That's not what it's saying. You'll know everything about everything, all that there is to be known. That can't be the, that can't be what it means, because God himself is infinite. 
And it is utterly impossible for any finite creature to know everything that there is to know about an infinite God. So that's clearly not the meaning. It's not that he's, he's saying that's the case, but I will guide you, he will guide you into all the truth, that is, the fixed body of revealed truth, of faith and practice that the Lord has given to us. The revealed truth that the Lord gives us through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that complete perfection of Scripture will be provided for us. So it's, it's not saying the Spirit will lead you into some sort of mystical experiences beyond the Scripture, but into all of the resources of this depository of, of rich biblical uh, truth that he has given to us. Notice that it says, for, here's a reason, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. He will show you, and he will show you things to come. He will not speak of himself. And the, the idea here is, you know, we, we read that and we think, okay, what, it, what it's saying is he will not speak about himself. But that doesn't capture the meaning of the text. It's more akin to saying he will not speak from himself. Right? He's not speaking from himself, but what he hears, he will speak. Notice we read 1 Corinthians chapter 2 just a few moments ago, and you see how Paul develops this uh, point in that particular passage, beginning in verse uh, 10. 1 Corinthians 2. He says in verse 10, but God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things. Notice the connection with our text. Yea, the deep things of God. And he goes on to say, you know, even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we've received these things. The Lord reveals them to us by a Spirit. So the Spirit is the one who guides us into the truth. The Spirit is the one who knows and has access to the truth about God himself. He gives it to us in the Bible, and he illuminates our hearts and minds, as we'll see more in a moment, to, to understand it. And so the Spirit is not an independent agent, as it were. He, he is the third person of the Godhead, and the three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, dwelling in perfect un, uh, unity, he, he shares in the divine counsels and hears uh, from the Father and the Son as one who is equal to them with full divine authority. And so the things that originate and are known in the mind of God are communicated or revealed in the scriptures by the ministry of the Holy Spirit. That underlines the inspiration and infallibility of this word that he has, has given to us. But he, he breaks it down. He, he'll, whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. So you think of this book, right? The Holy Spirit is the one, as 1 Peter 2 says, who enabled holy men of God to give us, under the inspiration, the very mind of God. So the word, the Bible, is the word of God. What the Bible says, God says, because the Holy Spirit is the author of it. And you think about what it contains. It contains recorded history. So it gives us accurate, true, historical facts and faith. We have a historical faith. So the life and ministry of Jesus, as it's described, is found here. These historical record of who Jesus is. A couple chapters ago, chapter 14, verse 26, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. So the Spirit, after Christ's ascension, is now bringing to the remembrance the truths of what Jesus has conveyed. So he's saying, we will know and do know what really did happen. This is absolutely crucial. You can't start tinkering 
with the Bible and saying, well, you know, historical facts may be, you know, gobbled. They may be, or garbled rather, they may be mixed up. They may be, you know, some inaccuracies and so on. You can't detach the historical facts of redemption from the doctrine that is conveyed in those historical facts. And I was spent a couple of hours on the plane last evening sitting next to a woman talking to her about uh, the Lord. And she's saying, well, you know, the problem is we should just, people should be able to um, go to the Bible and get their own meaning out of the Bible, you know, and they, they shouldn't have all this dogmatism and, and so on forced on them. And, you know, I was explaining to her, well, if you wrote me a letter, you know, you would want me to be interested in what you meant by the words you were writing to me. And if instead I took your letter and said, well, this is what it means to me, and I developed this, you know, convoluted thing out of it and then held it against you, you'd be offended. She got the point. But I went on to say, you know, the, the historical facts of Christ's crucifixion are essential to the truths that are expounded from those facts. You know, we think about the cross and what's taking place there. These things can't be detached. So there's recorded history. There's also doctrine, right? He's, the Spirit is going to lead us into all truth, the explanation and exposition of those historical facts. Why did Jesus die? Right now we're, we're talking about doctrine. To say Jesus Christ died and was crucified upon a cross is history. But then to say the Lord Jesus Christ died for the sins of his people as a substitute and as a mediator between God and man, that's doctrine. That's the teaching that flows from those facts. But that's not all. He says at the end of verse 13, and he will show you things to come. That's prophecy. He's going to tell you about events that are future to you, disciples, and in many cases to us as well in 2017. The Holy Spirit is going to reveal events that are future to us. And of course, that's the case. I mean, we, as I've said before, we know what is otherwise impossible for anyone to know. Scientists with all their brilliance and, you know, People with advanced technology and everything else, they cannot tell you the future, right? They can guess, they can see economic trends, they can look at the, uh, uh, what's going on in the atmosphere and s take a stab at predicting what weather is coming and so on and so forth. They, that's the most they can do and it's all speculative, it's all hypothetical. They certainly can't tell us what's going to happen many years from now, decades or centuries from now even, but the Christian can do what no one else can do. Not because we have, you know, better intellectual ability, but because God has revealed things to us by the Holy Spirit. He's told us about things that are future. And we know about things that have to take place between now and the second coming of Christ. We know about the second bodily return of Christ. We know about the final day, the judgment day that is coming. We know what's going to unfold there. We know about an eternal heaven and an eternal hell and so on and so forth. These things are certain. They're absolutely certain. God has showed them to us in his word, just as he had showed to his people of the past things that have now already taken place in the coming of the Lord Jesus. It's interesting. The book of Revelation opens with verse 1 like this, the revelation of Jesus Christ. So here's the Holy Spirit inspiring a book. And what is it? It's a revelation of Jesus Christ, first and foremost, which God gave unto him uh, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. Right? It's saying here's a revelation of Christ of things that are to come in the future. And so the Spirit shows us the truth of Christ. He is a guide. The Holy Spirit guarantees that the Lord's people don't end up lost. If you go out west and you want to go, you know, out into the, the wilderness and you hire a guide, part of their job is to make sure, first of all, you don't get lost. You don't end up 
in the middle of nowhere with no one able to find you or that you don't fall off a cliff or down into a ravine or something else. But the guide is also to ensure that you arrive at your destination. You know, if you're going to hike Mount Rainier, his job is to know the trail and to ensure that you get to the top and back again. This is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He ensures that the Lord's people are not left in some dark, murky morass of ill-defined, undefined truth. He guides us, ensures that we come to an understanding of the truth. That takes place by inspiration, inspiring the apostles to give us this revealed truth of God. But it also comes by way of the ministry of illumination. So the inspiration of Holy Scripture is outside of us. We can hold up the book. There it is. That's the Word of God that has been given to us. But the ministry of the Holy Spirit in terms of illumination is something that takes place inside of us, not outside of us, where the Spirit opens our eyes to be able to see, believe, and understand the truth that is found in this book. Because there, is a, there are countless multitudes who read their Bible or who hear sermons and are utterly clueless, who don't understand the truth, who don't believe what they're hearing, and who are not transformed by it. The ministry of the Holy Spirit comes to our sin-darkened soul and gives light to our minds and writes the Word of God on our hearts. And so the Spirit and the Word are working together. So all this business about appealing to the Holy Spirit in a way that is detached from the Scriptures is terrifying. There is untold number of false teachings and false practices which have gone under the guise of the Spirit told me to do X, Y, and Z or to believe X, Y, and Z. No, this passage gives no place to these sorts of unbiblical mysticism. We come to the Bible, our first question is, what does the text say? Not, what does the text mean to me? No, what does God say? And then, what are the implications for me? You can't just, as people are so fond of doing, you know, they'll have a book of promises and you, 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 you read through those, but if you go back and find the promises in the Bible, you often find that they have wrested them out of their context and completely distorted them into something that was not at all intended by God in those words. We need to be sure that we're recognizing the connection between the Spirit and the Word. So the Spirit shows us the truth of Christ But then secondly, the Spirit shows us the glory of Christ, verses 14 and 15. The Spirit shows us the glory of Christ. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father Father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. So the end. The aim of the Holy Spirit is to glorify the Son. The aim of the Spirit is to glorify the Son. Now, what does it mean for the Spirit to glorify the Son? It doesn't mean that he adds to Christ's glory. So Jesus has one amount or degree of glory, and the Spirit somehow complements or supplements that and thereby adds to his glory. No, that's not what's meant. For the Spirit to glorify the Son is for the Spirit to work in the heart and mind of the Lord's people to open up our view and experience of the glory that belongs to the Son. So he is, his glory is manifest, is opened, is exhibited, is uh, revealed to us by the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Remember what I said uh, a couple of weeks ago, think children in terms of floodlights, right? You're driving down the road at night and there's a house and it's all lit up, right? There's just, it's all bright 
And you, what's happening? Well, there are, there are floodlights that are hid in the bush. You don't see the floodlights. But the floodlight's job is to cast light on the house or on the building, or whatever it is. And this is the ministry of the Holy Spirit, not to direct, as it were, attention first and foremost to himself, but his role is to expose and to set forth the glory uh, that belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. So you put these pieces together, right? We've, we've been learning little bit by little bit all of these components of the biblical doctrine of the Trinity. We've heard that Jesus says that the Son, that he has glorified his Father on earth. We hear in the next chapter, and we've actually heard already previously, but we'll hear again in chapter 17, that the Father glorifies the Son in heaven. And now we're hearing that the Holy Spirit glorifies the Son in the hearts and minds of his people. So there are three persons in the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. These three are one God, the same in substance, equal in power and glory, as all of the children know from their catechism. They share in the divine glory because they're one in substance. The Father is glorifying the Son, the Son is glorifying the Father, the Spirit is glorifying uh, the Son, and so on. There's this magnification, as it were, in our own hearts and minds of the glory that belongs to the thrice holy God. And so it's, it's not, it is not a mark of the ministry of the Holy Spirit if the whole focus of that ministry is merely on the Holy Spirit. So if there are churches where the whole um, infatuation or focus is entirely on the person of the Spirit, there's a problem. Because the ministry of the Spirit is to show us the glory of the Son. And so it is not a evidence of the ministry of the Holy Spirit if Christ is not being magnified. Now, you know, the ministry of the Holy Spirit is not present if Jesus is, any way de- is in any way denied or in any way dishonored either. The Spirit is not active if whatever is being promoted is disobedience to Scripture. The Lord is not schizophrenic. You know, you can't have the Bible saying one thing and the Holy Spirit saying another thing. You can't say, well, yeah, yeah, that's what the Bible says, but the Spirit's leading me to think this, believe this, do this, or anything else. Impossible. So if, if, if we're being sold on something that is out of accord with the Scriptures and doctrine or life, it is not the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Our doctrine should be drawing us to Christ. Our practice should be magnifying the surpassing excellency of the knowledge of Christ. Everything should be extolling him. You think of the context that we've just come out of in this uh, chapter. The Holy Spirit comes to convict the world of sin. The Spirit comes to humble, to break, to expose, to even terrify the conscience because of its sin. But the Spirit does that in order to drive the sinner who is being drawn to Christ, to show the sinner how suitable the all-sufficiency of the Savior is. Right? He's convincing us of righteousness, as we've seen as well, and of the righteousness of God that is found in this all-sufficient Savior. The Spirit leads us to embrace the Lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Spirit increases and causes us to grow and abound in a, in a growing faith in the Lord Jesus Christ in greater degrees of our understanding of who He is and of our confidence in Him. It draws, the Spirit draws us to serve Christ so that even in our workplace, we are not first and foremost interested in our advancement, but His advancement. We're not first and foremost interested in merely our daily bread or what our boss thinks. But as Colossians and Ephesians both teach us, the servant has his eye not on the earthly master, but on his heavenly master. 
You're to do these things, he says, as unto the Lord. You're to serve Christ, not be a men pleaser, not merely engage in eye service. Right? The ministry of the Spirit is drawing us to serve Christ. The ministry of the Spirit also draws us to suffer for Christ, to willingly give ourselves to suffering for the Lord Jesus Christ, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. This is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And of course, the Spirit leads us in all of these things chiefly to behold him, to see and know who Christ is as he's revealed in the Holy Scriptures as this great exhibition of the glory of God. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18, but we all with open face, beholding as in a glass or a mirror, the glory of the Lord. What are we doing? We're seeing the glory of Christ in the mirror of the Bible. It says, in a glass, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. The Spirit is taking and transforming us into the image and likeness of Christ by showing us, by enabling us to see the Lord Jesus Christ. The Spirit glorifies the Son. And of course, the church is thereby made glorious, or in the words of Scripture, Christ will be glorified in all the saints. He will be glorified in the last day in all the saints. Well, the question comes, how does the Holy Spirit carry this out? How does the Spirit do it? Verse 14 tells us, He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. So how does he do it? How does he carry this out? By receiving or taking and showing. He will receive of mine. Notice in verse 15, all things that the Father hath are mine. So what does that mean? Well, we heard earlier in this gospel, I and the Father are one, Jesus says. And so here Jesus is saying all that is the Father's is Christ's. And he's saying in verse 14, all that is Christ's is the Holy Spirit's, which means that all, all that is the Father's is the Holy Spirit's. And so you see all of the pieces are being put together. We have the unity, a sub unity of substance, one in essence. The three persons of the Godhead share this substantial unity, a oneness of essence, the unity of divine perfection in the Godhead. And the order of this is displayed in the economy of God's grace. The Father plans, the Son purchases, the Holy Spirit applies. One will, one mind, one action, one work of salvation, all being carried forward in the power of the three persons of the Godhead. And so the divine riches of grace, the divine riches of glory are all in common. What is the Father's is the Son's is the Spirit's. They're all held in common. And so when the Holy Spirit comes in converting a person, the Holy Spirit is the one who is the agent who is at work in applying the things of Christ to our soul. Well, there is a righteousness that is to be found in Christ for a justified sinner that is received by faith. The Holy Spirit is the one who gives new life to the soul. The Holy Spirit is the one who gives faith to the soul to receive that imputed righteousness to be accepted before God. The resources of God the Father's divine righteousness, which is secured in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ as a mediator on behalf of his people, is taken by the Spirit and imparted, credited to the account of the Lord's people. You can take anything else that we receive from God and you can trace it back to all three persons of the Godhead. And you can see that though the Spirit is the one applying these things to us, it comes out of the infinite resources of a triune God. The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, the Bible says. So the divine love, the electing love of the Father 
the love of Christ in giving himself. All of this love is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. You can think in terms of the power, divine power of God or the wisdom of God or you name it. All of these resources, this is how the Spirit is receiving, is taking, and he is showing these things unto us. He takes of Christ to show these things to his people. And notice that. And shall show it. And shall show it unto you, he says. The Spirit is pointing us to Christ, showing us Christ, increasing our dependence upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And there is no one better qualified than the Holy Spirit to do so. The Spirit is preeminently the Spirit of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit is the one who has dwelt with Christ eternally within the Godhead. But in Christ's incarnation, as he comes to this world, the Holy Spirit is the one who is with Christ every step of the way. He is conceived in the womb of the Virgin Mary by the Holy Ghost. All the way along, he's growing in stature and in, in, in favor with God and man by the Holy Ghost. He's driven into the wilderness by the Holy Ghost. He receives the baptism of the Holy Ghost. It's by the Spirit that he accomplishes the miracles and preaches the things that he said. Hebrews tells us that even in his cross work, he's upheld by the Holy Spirit there. The Spirit is the one who protects his physical body in the grave, waiting for the resurrection three days later. He's raised from the dead by the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He ascends to heaven. He's given the fullness of the Holy Spirit, which he pours out upon his people. The Spirit is the best qualified to be able to take the things of Christ and to show them unto us. No one is better. God gives his bride the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ and enables us to perceive the surpassing excellency that is found in him. The Spirit gives us the faith to receive Christ as our Savior, to receive him as our Lord, to receive him as our heavenly husband, as our Lord and as our God to receive him as our mediator, to receive him in all of the capacities and offices and work that he has undertaken for us. The Spirit shows the glory of Christ. So we can ask a simple question. Do the doctrines we believe, do the ministries that we follow, do the experiences that we have in our Christian walk lead us to Christ. I cannot overemphasize the importance of that question. Does our doctrine and practice, our ministry, our experience, do all of these things lead us to the person of the Lord Jesus Christ? Is the tenor of what we know and see and love, does it make much of Christ? Does The things that shape us, do the things that shape us make much of the Lord Jesus Christ? I mean, the question is, do you esteem yourself the Lord Jesus Christ? No one can answer that question for you. Do you esteem him? Is he the exalted one, the Lord of glory? Is he the one who is altogether beautiful and altogether excellent? Is he the one whom you you recognize as the pearl of great price? Is he the treasure to you? Is he the one that captivates your affections and your mind and your heart, your thoughts? Do you esteem Christ? Or is it rather that you view Christ as serving your own interests? So I'm a Christian because I want a godly marriage. I'm a Christian because I want my kids to turn out. I'm a Christian because I hope I will be successful at work. I'm a Christian because it's got the best, you know, teaching on how to carry out moral responsibility and so on. In all of those sorts of cases, and we could multiply them, Jesus is a means to your personal end, which I am constantly preaching against. 
Is it rather that you see your chief end as glorifying and enjoying him? That you exist for his interests? That your whole life is consumed with advancing his glory, his kingdom, seeing him magnified? Only the Holy Spirit can do that in us. Only the Holy Spirit is the one who brings that to pass. And my friends, there is a great deal of comfort this morning. If you honor the Son, if you love the Son, what wonderful comfort there is in that. To see the ministry of the Holy Spirit doing in us, with us, for us, and by us what would be beyond our reach. The Spirit is coming and transforming us and drawing us to God himself and God as he is manifest in Christ and causing us to love the one who is the object of beauty and of perfection, Christ himself. You know, it's tempting when you come to, pa- you come to passages like this. And it's, this is a more heavily doctrinal passage, isn't it? And it's a passage that's Trinitarian, and it's a passage that's opening up to us who God is and how the three persons of the one Godhead relate to one another and so on. And we can begin to think to ourselves, well, you know, we come to the passage, and if we've been trained poorly, we come to a passage of Scripture, and our first question, our primary question, sometimes our only question is, what is the practical payoff that comes out of this passage? My friends, we we have to remember to know God, the knowledge of God in the Lord Jesus Christ. To know God, to know Christ, is an end in itself. To know Christ is an end in itself. When we read in the Bible about the beatific vision, that is the revelation of Christ in glory, which the Christian will drink in through resurrected physical eyes. That will not be the glory of heaven because somehow it's going to do something to advance me. It will be an end in itself to behold the Lord, to see the Lord, to revel in the Lord, to glory in the Lord, to have disclosed and opened up to us the riches of his beauty and so on. Knowing God is not a means to another end. Knowing God is the greatest end of all. Everything else is a means to it. Now, it's true, as we saw from 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18, knowing God also brings the greatest benefit of all. What is that? It brings us the privilege of being made like him. So we are trans, the knowledge of God, the knowledge of Christ transforms us into his likeness. So as many, many people have said, you become like what you worship. So in Psalm 115, as we know so well from singing it, you know, the idols, they have eyes, but they see not ears, but they hear not mouths, but they speak not and so on. And it goes on to say, and those who make them are like unto them. Right? There's the principle. And so, idolatry transforms the idolater into the gross wickedness of the idol. It debases humanity and defies and dishonors God himself. But it's the opposite when it comes to the Lord. To know him, to see him, to receive him by faith, to worship him, to give our life uh, to him is the means the Lord uses to transform us from the inside out. From glory to glory, we're made into the likeness of Christ himself. So in that sense, the knowledge of Christ is, at the end of the day, if you will, the most practical thing in the whole entire universe. Because knowing him, which was Paul's chief ambition, we could, you go back to Moses, what does Moses want? What is he craving? What is he longing for? What is he dying for? He's saying, I beseech thee. He's saying, I am urging, pleading, crying, begging 
What, Moses, what is it that you so desperately want? I beseech thee, show me thy glory. We go to David, it's the same thing. We, sang from, we read from Psalm 27, One thing have I desired, to behold the beauty of the Lord. Moses, David, go to Paul. He speaks about the surpassing excellency of the knowledge of Christ, that I may know him. It's all the same. Moses, David, Paul, we could go elsewhere. I mean, John says the same thing about eternal life being to know the Father and the Son. You see, my friends, coming to know the Lord as he reveals himself to us in his word by the ministry of the Holy Spirit is the means he uses to transform us into the likeness of God, God God-likeness, godliness, Christ-likeness. And so far, far from being impractical, it is supremely practical. The Spirit shows us the glory of Christ. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. Let's stand together for prayer. O Lord, our God in heaven, we bow down our hearts before you and confess that you are a God that is altogether lovely, a God whose glory surpasses our comprehension. And yet we delight, O Lord, to know uh, any and all that we do know of who you are, and we thank you for the ministry of the Spirit who comes and provides for us a completed canon, the holy scriptures of God, and who illuminates our minds and enables us to see and understand, to comprehend and believe uh, the truths uh, that are found in Christ. We thank you for the revelation of Christ himself and for all of the wonder and delight that there is for the believing soul to know him and delight in him. Lord, we pray, grant that this would increase more and more and that we would revel in all that is to be found in him. For we ask these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Let's respond to the reading and preaching of God's word by singing from Psalm 43. Verses 3 to 5, the tune is invocation. So if you have the, the red psalter, it's at the very back of, this, of the psalter. It's the first full sheet, uh, number 192. And there are some portions that are repeated here. So you'll f- follow the presenter if you're not familiar with uh, the tune. But notice how, how closely this is connected to our text. O send thy light forth and thy truth, let them be guides to me, and bring me to thine holy hill, even where thy dwellings be. Then will I to God's altar go, to God my chiefest joy, and so on. We'll sing Psalm 43, verses 3 to 5, to the tune invocation number 192.
stand for the benediction. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.